these local bodies. And uh, that number is about to be raised to something between 16 and 18 lakhs when Parliament is allowed to meet by the opposition and we can actually pass the constitutional amendment that will raise reservations for women from 33 to 50 percent, both in the seats as well as in the courts. Equally, there has been very, very conscientious implementation of the provisions regarding the reservations for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes to the point where I think Dr. Ambedkar's fears, which were responsible for Panchayati Raj not being brought into the constitution in a major way in 1948-50, have now been met. Indeed, figures from Karnataka would indicate that for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe women, that is the most discriminated against segment of the most discriminated against and historically disadvantaged sections of our society, as against 33% of the positions for STs being reserved for ST women, the actual <coughs> for ST women is of the order of 64%, 65%. And among the scheduled castes, it is of the order of 54%, which would indicate that scheduled tribe and scheduled caste women are taking far greater advantages of these new avenues of political empowerment than women from the Swarna Jati, which is hardly surprising when one considers that scheduled caste and scheduled tribe women are for their own employment and livelihood much more in the public sphere than women of the Swarna Jati are. And so they are the ones who have taken the biggest advantage. This social engineering is actually taking place to the extent to which political empowerment is what leads to other forms of empowerment. We did a study when I was Minister of Panchayati Raj on elected women representatives, EWRs as they are called in an acronymic form, and we found that there were some unexpected spin-offs. Number one, a very large number of the women interviewed, and there were 20,000 of them interviewed, said that their empowerment in the public sphere led to empowerment in the private sphere. That those who had contested elections, whether they had won or lost, found that their husbands were consulting them more about which schools to send the kids to, or which uh, doctor to take them to in the event of illness, or in the disposal of family property. Now, this was an unexpected spin-off, but I think an extremely <coughs> important spin-off. Also, we found that uh, the number of women who got elected was but a small fraction of the number of women who contested the election. And the process of contesting the elections involves approximately 50 to 60 lakh women in India coming out for the first time in their lives from their kitchens and their courtyards, and going down streets, knocking at anonymous doors, and as a huge man wearing only a vest and a lungi comes out, saying to him, please don't vote for Gita, vote for me, because my name is Gita and I'm a better candidate. <laughs> But what I think is the most encouraging is that this has been achieved without any significant male opposition. When I was uh, working with the Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, the minister in charge of uh, this question <coughs> was from Sri Kya Punya State, and the political opposition that he put it's called Sri Bajanda. And Bajanda, he would say to me, and I think he sincerely meant it, he said he had no objection whatsoever <coughs> to women coming into politics at the local level. But he asked me, <coughs> And I think the Mahilas themselves have answered this question. Because it was there in one's mind. Would we be able, in one stroke of the legal pen, as it were, to overcome social and cultural inhibitions and barricades that have existed for all the thousands of years of recorded Indian history. And I must say the women of India have proved that they are totally capable of breaking these barricades. And the men of India 
very untrue that if these barricades are broken, they are not going to engage themselves in setting them up again. And this, I think, is the most encouraging aspect of uh, all that has happened in the Chayati Raj. I'm not a great one myself for political reservations for the OBCs, because they are not a minority, they are a minority. Nevertheless, the law provides that the state can have reservations for OBCs if they so desire. And in the states where the OBCs reservations have been brought in, and these are a majority of our states, that system too seems to have worked very well. So in terms of representation for the people, in terms of what Rajiv Gandhi wanted, which was to convert India, which he said was undoubtedly the world's largest democracy, but also undoubtedly the world's least representative democracy, into being simultaneously both the world's largest democracy and the world's most representative democracy, I think we have succeeded astonishingly. So much so that my private boast, which I wish would become a national boast, is that there are more elected women in India alone than in the rest of the world put together. Astonishing achievement is not known to most thinking and speaking Indians. Indeed, the applause that I just heard shows that this was something of a revelation to even such an enlightened group of people as the lawyers of India. And why is that so? I think basically it is because although representational recognition has been given to the Indian underclass, they are still not empowered in administrative or economic terms to be able to exercise the powers that are inherent in political empowerment. And this is because the recommendatory aspects of parts 9 and 9a are the ones which deal with the processes content and objectives of empowerment. All this is left entirely, as Mr. Chakravarti was attempting to say when needlessly you began applauding, incorporated in Article 243G of the Constitution. 243G says that the legislature of a state may by law, the responsibility is vested in the legislature of a state, and it goes on to say that they will decide what powers to uh, entrust to the local bodies. And many of the states, having picked up all the 29 subjects that are given in the 11th schedule of the Constitution, to which Rikiyar Punya was referring, have passed laws with schedules which say that all these are to be devolved to the local bodies. But then it is left to the executive to devise the means by which this is to be done and the extent to which it is to be done. And there the executive comes under the influence of its own legislators, in addition to those of the opposition, plus of course the prejudices in the minds of the bureaucracy. Now the worst thing that happened to independent India was Mr. Punya and I. For the best and the brightest of our undergraduates, at least till about our generation, went into the IAS and other civil services. And we had been told from childhood up that you are really a very, very bright young boy. You were patted on our heads by our mothers, our grandmothers, our aunts. You were patted on our heads by our teachers and our principals. We then proved what superb human beings we were by contesting against lakhs of other undergraduates like ourselves and standing first or 10th or 20th, whatever it is, in the civil services exam and having this having success written into our careers as the ladder of success was implanted in our careers at the age of 22. Now this makes for an extremely arrogant civil service which believes 
that it has the answers. And the proof that it has the answers to the problems of those who didn't make it to the IAS is that the problems are those of the people and the solutions are those of the IAS. In consequence of this, we have devised <coughs> systems of poverty alleviation which result, as Rajiv Gandhi said, in 85 paise in the rupee going into administrative expenses. Rajiv did not say corruption, and this clarification is very, very essential. He said it went into administrative expenses. Corruption comes afterwards. 85 paise. There is a member, or there was a member of the Planning Commission till very recently, Dr. Kiri Pai, who undertook a study of his own. And his conclusion was that Rajiv Gandhi was completely wrong. It is not 85 paise in the rupee. It's 83 paise in the rupee that goes into <laughs> The Prime Minister has uh, said publicly, and as he's a great economist, guru even to Barack Obama, we must uh, take what he has to say seriously. He said he thinks these figures are somewhat exaggerated. Right? So let us say that administrative expenses are taking 75 to 85 paise in the rupee. What are the consequences? The consequence is that between 1994 and 2010 or 2009, the central budgetary provisioning for social sector schemes and anti-poverty programs rose from 7,600 crore to 135,000 crore and has now crossed more than 1.5 lakh crore. That is an increase in outlays of 15 times over a period of 15 years. There's nowhere in the world where as much money is being spent on abolishing poverty as we are doing in India in relative terms. And yet what is the outcome? That in 1994, India stood at position 134 on the UN Human Development Index. In 2009, India had moved from position 134 to position 130. And there had been no impact in terms of outcomes of a 15 times increase in outlays. How can you explain this except with reference to the utter brilliance of our civil service? It is they who have devised the means by which money that is meant for the poor somehow gets absorbed all along the way and cannot be coordinated when it reaches the beneficiaries. We had, when I became Minister of Panchayati Raj in 2004, approximately 300 different centrally sponsored schemes, all aimed at the same set of beneficiaries, those living in our villages and largely below the poverty line. The Planning Commission trimmed that to about 100. But even today we have a hundred schemes delivered through one hundred independent silos, each of which is firmly insulated from the other and requires a separate dedicated bureaucracy to run that show. So the service of Sharjah, there is an entire bureaucracy starting from Shastri Bhavan and ending in every village of India to handle the education program. If you have a national rural health mission, it has its own bureaucracy starting in Nirman Bhavan and ending in every single village of India. Completely independent of the bureaucracy and technocracy that is running education. Equally, we have the Rajiv Gandhi drinking water mission. That has its own bureaucracy and technocracy completely isolated